Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I was saying, then you had a warship uh, that was not completely, that, that was not really dilapidated either. It was called the, the Screw Frigate. Because I'm not, not looking at no notes, and it's cold outside, so I'm trying to stop shaking. The Screw Frigate uh, Merrimack. That's what it was called. And so, this shipyard, uh, when, when, the, when the Confederates ended up taking over it, it gave them somewhat of a little boost. And, they, and, and as I'm reading about this, it is claimed that that's what helped them get even more ships. Like later on throughout the war, even though the Union started out with 90 ships, the Confederacy ended up getting 101 ships. But I want to add my what, what I think to that. Just, because, just based on what I read during Chapter 2, when I was doing my research for uh, Chapter 2 of Legends and Lies of the Civil War. And I found out about, like, I was reading about the King Cotton Theory, or the King Cotton Strategy, and how uh, the Confederacy ended up, you know, trading with private tours, or privateers, kind of like how the Americans did, or New England did. During the American Revolutionary War, it's the same thing the South ended up doing. And 60% of their cotton ended up being traded in exchange for many of these ships. So I don't think it was just Gosport, Portsmouth, Virginia, as far as that particular Navy shipyard that helped them out. That helped them ended up getting that 101 amount of ships. I think a lot of that had to do with them trading with those private tourists and getting some of these warships as well. I mentioned that in Chapter 2. Now that now that was what was going on in April because that place, like I said, uh, Gosport, Portsmouth, Virginia, was abandoned in exactly April twentieth, actually, which is fucking odd. You know, because that's around the time the Battle of Annapolis was going on in Maryland. You know what I'm saying? Uh, as well as the Battle of Baltimore, Maryland, and all of that with the seventh and eighth, the seventh and ninth uh, infantry or regiment or whatever. But anyway, yeah, <coughs> so. April twentieth. That's when they, you know, they gained that shipyard or whatever. So it was a, it was a, a, a little bit of a boost. Now going back further, not going back, but going further into the fall of eighteen sixty one. This is when, months later, Robert Smalls was assigned officially to the CSS Confederate Planter ship. And it was described as pretty light, but as far as the keel of the ship, because this turned out a benefit once the Union uh, took hold of this ship after Robert Small's escape. I'll get to that in a second. <coughs> but it was a pretty light, sheet, light, light ship, but it had some benefits to it. He got assigned to the ship. Now, this is when the duties come into mind, what I was going to mention before. Like, some of his, uh, his, his, his job, like a part of his job description, because he was steering the ship, was, you know, navigating the waterways, also stopping at islands and different um, Confederate forts to transport ammunition, military supplies overall, troops, as well as intel, and messages in the form of dispatches. By that point, uh, <coughs> you know, and I don't know if this is due to his mother and his early upbringing that kind of informed how he was able to. And I don't know if I should just use the word ingratiate. But at this point, he had gained the trust of these Confederates, like the commander, like the district commander at the time was a guy by the name of Ro Roswell uh, S. Ripley. As far as the captain of the ship itself. Uh, the guy, his name was um, Charles C.J. Rail. Yeah, he has an awkward last name. It's spelled R-E-L-Y-E-A. All right. Now, <clears throat> as far as this guy, you know, Robert Smalls learned a lot by paying attention to him, even though they really trusted him. As far as like the crewmen, aside from the white ones, it was about eight other black men as well. None of them were free, of course. They were also slaves. Uh, <coughs> uh, so they gain this trust sometimes they have their families come along and, and kick it with them or whatnot. So, him gaining income or whatever, so look at the income, even though slightly before this, he had this yarn he wanted to pay for his or buy or purchase 
his family's freedom. He calculated that it would be about $800 in total. So he saved money for a while, but he only had like one eighth of that. He saved up to like $100. And based on calculations, uh, it would have taken him or taken him literally decades to get uh, $800, which in today's amounts is like twenty-six plus thousand dollars or whatnot, right? <laughs> but what he ended up doing, like I say, when I'm at the beginning of this, when I said... Aside from them like participating in the lit in in politics directly during Reconstruction, man, th this is like one of the things that's really highlightable about him, in my opinion, because he ended up making a lick once he escaped. He made fifteen hundred. I get to that in a second. So he kind of like flipped that instead of just uh, saving, you know, spending fucking decades saving money to purchase in his family's freedom. He took a very big chance, but I, I'm going to keep it in order real quick. I just wanted to mention that at the time. Keep that in mind. <laughs> that's why that's why I, I titled this uh, Robert Smalls, The Unveiled Dissident. So anyway, so the very next year, early in April of 1862, this is when he started, like, you know, uh, thinking about the mechanisms of his plan, like as far as like how he was going to uh, escape and beguile the shit of, out of these white officers. And he was serious to the point where he also verbalized this to some of those uh, black uh, crewmen, except one. There was one in particular that was mentioned that he did not trust. They didn't give his name or whatever. And he also communicated this to Hannah Jones. So, May the 12th came. On that particular day, he a part of, he, he was basically ordered. They had to sail to Coal Island, right? Now, that's uh, on the river, on a river called Stono River, which also runs into the Charleston Harbor, of course. And the reason they had to go there, they had to pick up like some cannon guns or whatever, about at least four of them. And then once they picked those guns up, they had to sail back to Charleston and then uh, also continue to unload up onto the CSS planter, which was uh, about 200 pounds worth of ammunition. And then also like some some firewood, as mentioned, like it, it was mentioned 20 cores of firewood. I don't know exactly what 20 cores of firewood translates to, but that was what was mentioned, right? So later on in the evening, everything, it was pretty much finished with their duties for the day. Now, it was three white officers in total. One was the captain, Mr. Rail Yeah, for example, right? They decided to sleep on shore instead of sleeping on a ship. So in Robert Small's mind, he took that as, a, as an ample opportunity, ample opportunity to execute his plan. Just before those guys left and got on shore, he asked the captain, he said, look, is it all right if we uh, have our families come here? Like I mentioned already, sometimes they would do that. The guy said, yeah, just make sure they leave by curfew. <laughs> so they went ahead and had their families, right? Not just him, but those other black guys, too, that was in on this. <laughs> Only thing is, none of the women and children, but especially the women of these, of these guys, knew what was about to happen in that particular moment. Neither did Hannah Jones, even though she knew eventually he was going to attempt to escape. She didn't like he didn't, they didn't give them uh, enough time to mentally prepare for that. So when they showed up or whatever and the guys unveiled to their wives uh, what, what they were going to do that night. First off, Hannah Jones herself. You know, she was struck or whatever. She was kind of like in a little panic mode, but then she got it together. And uh, it's mentioned that she said, you know, she said some poetic type shit like, all right, well, if you die, I'm going to end up dying with you because we're trying to get free, etc." As far as the other ladies, they were saying that they had broke down. They like they were in shock and they started screaming and crying because at this point it was not going to be no turning back. This, this is what those guys was going to execute. Now, you already know. So there's no need to get too loquacious about this. You already know the consequences of what they will face. Keep in mind, remember, Charleston Harbor, a lot of those forts were occupied by the Confederates, especially the main one, Fort Sumter. That's the one that, uh, that I mentioned in Chapter 1 as well, that Robert Anderson and, and, and Abner Doubleday was at <coughs> for like two days from April 11th 
to April 13th and got 